Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon to all participants, moderator, panelists from Malaysia, and good morning to panelists from United Kingdom, Prof. Martin and Dr. Mike. Now, Malaysian time is 3.30 p.m. and UK time is 7.30 a.m. Am I correct, Prof. Martin? So, welcome everyone. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. This is Health System Research Forum, titled Impact on, of COVID-19 Pandemic on Non-Communicable Disease Management and Health System, the Global and Nation Perspective. My name is Dr. Maza Puspavina Mayasin from Faculty of Medicine, UITM Selayang. I am your host for today. And on behalf of the organizing committee, Malaysia Response Study Team, and Centre of Translational Research and Epidemiology UITM, I am pleased to introduce RESPON study. A little bit on RESPON. RESPON is an international research collaboration which stands for Responsive and Equitable Health System Partnership on non communicable Disease, particularly hypertension condition. So this forum is as part of the RESPON study capacity building activities communications between respond key researchers with healthcare providers and stakeholders, in particular with the impact of COVID-19. As for a start here, I would like to share with everyone and welcome the Health System Research Project montage about this forum and moments of respond activities throughout the years. Please welcome the respond Health Research system research montage.
in the loving memory of our beloved Alwarham, the late Professor Emeritus, Dr. Dr. Khalid Yusuf, I appreciate moment of silence from everyone to recite Al-Fatiha and pray blessings for Allah. With that, may I invite Ustaz Muhammad Najih Irshad bin Ahmad Puhat, Islamic Affairs Officer from Rector's Office, UITM Selangor Campus, to recite doa before we start the forum. Please welcome Ustaz Najih Irshad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ya Karimu Ya Wadud, sesungguhnya kami berhimpun pada hari ini bagi menyatakan kesyukuran di atas kurniaanmu yang tidak ternilai. Jadikanlah kami hamba-hambamu yang sentiasa bersyukur sama ada nikmat yang sedikit lebih-lebih lagi, nikmat yang melimpah ruah kepada kami. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, engkau berkatilah dan rahmatilah perjalanan program Health System Research Forum Anjuran Center for Translational Research and Epidemiology pada petang ini, sesungguhnya pemaham mengetahui bahawa kami di sini ingin menimba ilmu yang sangat luas bagi mengembangkan ilmu pengetahuan kami kepada hamba-mu yang terdahai. Justru berkati dan rahmatilah perhimpunan kami ini. Ampunilah dosa-dosa ibu bapa kami, guru-guru kami, terutamanya kepada almarhum Profesor Emeritus Datuk Dr Khalid bin Yusuf kerana jasa dan bakti ilmu beliau selama ini. Ya Zal Jalali wal Ikram, kurniakanlah jua kepada kami kesihatan anggota, kejelkasan minda, ketenangan jiwa, kekuatan semangat. Semoga dengannya kami mampu mendepani cabaran berdaya saing dan mampu mengangkat martabat warga universiti dan masyarakat amni. Rabbana atina fi dunia hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana tawakina azaban nab. Sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين. آمين يا رب العالمين. Thank you very much, Ustaz Naji, for the beautiful du'a. We can proceed to the next agenda. Just a little housekeeping housekeeping announcement before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box or answer box or chat box in your Zoom control panel. The moderator may bring up them during the forum and we will also have time for questions at the end of the forum. You can also watch the live forum through FB Live at Facebook Centre Medic UM. Please do not forget to please fill up your attendance form link at the chat box or scan the QR code at the end of the session. They will be given 10 minutes time for the attendance link to be filled up within the 10 minutes after the session ends. For those who are just joining us, please welcome. Today, in the holy month of Ramadan, we are very delightful to have experienced moderator and panelists from UK and Malaysia on board in discussing the global and nation perspective on impact of COVID-19 pandemic on non-communicable disease management and health system. Firstly, I would like to introduce our moderator for this forum, Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim, who has experience as research scientist with the Rubber Research Institute of Malaysia and was the director of PORIM, Palm Oil Research Institute of Malaysia and Malaysia Palm Oil Promotion Council. He was also vice president research at CIRIM and the CEO of Academic Sciences Malaysia ASM and also Senior Advisor Malaysia for the Farm Fire Research Germany. In a nutshell, he has made important contributions to scientific research and design, development of science and technology policies for Malaysia, and writes extensively on science issue and a regular columnist in the New Straits Times. We move on to our panelists. Our first panelist, is Professor Dr. Martin McKee, who is the program leader, response study, 
and a professor of European Public Health from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, United Kingdom. Prof. Martin had respected position in research directives task, academics, and has received outstanding awards. He was the director of the European Center of Health of Societies in Transition, research, direct, research director of the European Observatory on Health System and Policies, former chair of the UK Society for Social Medicine, past president of the European Public Health Association, former chair of WHO European Advisory Committee on Research Health Research, and Global Health Advisory Committee for George Soros Open Society Foundation and a member of European Commission Expert Panel on the Investing in Health. He is recognized as the most outstanding and productive researcher, top 1% most cited researchers worldwide by Thomson and Reuters. He was an editor of the European Journal of Public Health and numerous editorial boards and editorial consultant to the Lancet. Our second panelist is Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Awang Bulgigeba Awang Mahmud from Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. He is the first nation doctor to gain a PhD in health informatics. Prof. Awang is currently heading the Independent COVID-19 Vaccination Advisory Committee in Malaysia and a research project, COVID-19 Epidemiological Analysis and Strategies, CS. He is currently a Secretary General for the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Council Member for the Academy of Medicine Malaysia, Chair of Malaysia's Public Health NSR Specialty Subcommittee, and President of the Malaysian Chapter for the Asia-Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health. Our third panelist, we move on to Dr. Faisal Izwan Mustafa. He is a public health and general medicine physician, cardiovascular and diabetes disease unit at the Disease Control Division, Ministry of Health Malaysia. He obtained his Master of Public Health in Epidemiology and Biostatistics from University of Bangsa Malaysia and subsequently accepted as the member of the Academic Medicine Malaysia. His field of expertise is the prevention and control of cardiovascular disease and diabetes disease from public health aspects. He is currently involved in the development of policies and programs for non-communicable disease in Malaysia. And he is actively, actively involved in research in Malaysia, particularly about diabetes and obesity. Last but not least, our fourth panelist is Dr. Mike Pecunas. Is the research fellow at the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health. He has vast experience in conducting social science research internationally, leading health intervention evaluations and capacity building. His interests include implementation research and understanding how the characteristic of an intervention, implementation process, contextual factors influence intervention, effectiveness and focus on integrating findings from diverse data sources. Dr. Mike has led implementation research project on the treatment of infectious disease such as malaria and viral hepatitis, delivery of mental health services and integrated health and social service programs. Now, please allow me to invite Prof. Dr. Martin McKee as the program leader of RESPOND to give short opening address for this forum. Please welcome Prof. Martin. Thank you very much indeed. And I am going to try to share my uh, slides and I hope that that will work. Can you see the title slide? Good. So yes. thank you very much indeed for uh, organizing this session and also for inviting me to participate. And um, obviously, uh, before we start, I want to pay my personal tribute to uh, Khalid Yusuf, who was a great personal friend and a collaborator for many years, both on Respond, but on the Pure Study, on Hope4, and many other things. And uh, we are deeply saddened to, um, to hear of his passing. 
I should say for our Malaysian friends, there will be a full obituary in the British Medical Journal in the next few weeks. So my uh, tribute and my, my sadness at uh, the loss of Khalid. I'm only going to say a very few words about Respond just to set it in context. This is work that emerged from our long collaboration in the PURE study. PURE study is a study being undertaken in 25 countries worldwide in which we're following up over 200,000 people, tracking the changing risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And now more broadly, as we're following people up longer, we're looking at declining cognitive function and cancer and other things in which we're collecting information, not just about people, uh, but also about the environments in which they live. Now, following on from that, we did the HOPE4 trial, a cluster randomized control trial in Malaysia and Colombia, which looked at the re, we were trying to understand the problems that people faced in management of their cardiovascular risk in hypertension. And this was published in the Lancet. It was a very successful study showing that a, an intervention tailored to the individual circumstances of the communities could bring about important changes. And the crucial point about this was that the intervention was designed through a process of co-creation, working with communities to understand the barriers that they face. From this work, we have understood that there are many barriers, even in a country like Malaysia, that has universal health care and which has a good, well-performing health system in many ways, but people still face challenges. So what we are doing is to, to recruit people from some of the poorest parts of the country, as you've seen in the montage, and to follow them up over the course of a year to understand the challenges that they are facing uh, in accessing healthcare. And we're doing this by compa we're comparing our findings with those from the Philippines, where we're doing exactly the same study. So we can look at the differences and similarities between two, con two countries that have a lot in common, but also have some things that are different. In particular, we're trying to understand the challenges people face, the pathways that they follow, and in particular, we're tracing the complex pathways that people follow in accessing care. It's not a linear process. It's not a straightforward journey. And we're also understanding how they move in and out of the formal health system, their use of traditional medicines and other sources of advice, the importance of friends and colleagues and family in terms of uh, accessing care. So I'm not going to say much more about that. The project, it has a research element, but it also has an important capacity building element, which is of course what we're doing here. And at that point, I will stop because I will be coming back to talk to you in a minute as we get into the panel. Okay, thank you, Prof. Martin. It's quite detailed introduction on the response study. It's very enlightening to hear the effort of helping this capacity building. Now, without further ado, please welcome Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim to start off with the forum. Please welcome Professor Datuk Ahmad Ibrahim. Anyway, uh, the forum is all about hypertension and how the pandemic is actually impacting on accessibility and management. So uh, to start off, I would like to request each and every panelist just to give a few minutes uh, of uh, your opening remarks about the, the topic. And after that, then we'll move on to the questions that have been posed uh, by uh, some uh, participants and also from other sources. Okay, can we start with Prof. Martin? If you can just uh, give us a take on the topic. Yes, with pleasure, uh, and hopefully Please. again you can yes. see the slide. So uh, very briefly, I, I'm going to be presenting just some a few slides uh, which are drawn from our experience with the European Observatory's COVID response monitor. And I would maybe draw your attention to that. If you just Google European Observatory, you will see that we're collecting um, evidence on uh, policy responses right across Europe. 
and also the work of the Independent Sage, which is the independent, an independent advisory group in the United Kingdom. Again, just have a look and Google us and look at our webpage because there is a wealth of information on both of those web pages. So uh, let me just, uh, I want to start off by looking at the wider impacts of COVID responses. And this is from a paper we published in the British Medical Journal back in uh, April 2020, in which we said, uh, we anticipated at the time that the pandemic would obviously have impacts through the effect of the virus and the uh, illness and death that would result from that. But there would be a whole range of other effects. Uh, there would be the effects of isolating at home, restrictions on non-essential sectors, um, transport restrictions, closure of educational facilities, and difficulty in accessing healthcare, and so on. Uh, so uh, this, I think, highlights the fact that this is a really complex situation and everything is interlinked. What have we actually found when we looked at the evidence? Well, this is from work in, um, again, drawn from a number of countries in Europe. Uh, we have seen a dramatic decline in consultations with general practitioners after the lockdown. The greatest declines have been for diabetic emergencies, depression and self-harm, and a large shift to online consultations. In Belgium, uh, there was an initial increase in consultations followed by a decline, and phone consultations went from virtually none, that did not happen prior to the pandemic, to 40% of the total, France, we also saw a fall in general practice consultations, and this has been happening really right across Europe. This is a paper we published in the Lancet Digital Health, and in these graphs, the um, I know it's difficult to see in the screen, but the blue lines uh, represent the average consultation rates by week uh, throughout 2017 to 2019, the averages, and the red lines show the decline, and virtually everything declined consultations went down for almost everything except for acute alcohol related events, but for depression, anxiety, diabetes, and so on. And then if we look more widely, we can see that uh, these, are, these are data from Scotland, a reduction in cancer diagnoses in uh, the, um, at the beginning of the lockdown, but uh, that subsequently changed and it recovered. Other evidence we have shows that there's a large backlog in cancer screening, um, consistent with this um, finding on the cancer diagnosis, a fall in childhood vaccination rates. Increase, interestingly, what we're seeing across Europe and many other countries is that there has not been an increase in suicides in contrast to the global financial crisis. And this, we believe, is because governments have intervened massively in the, the economy and done all of the things that we, in our earlier work, said that they should have done during the global financial crisis, support people who are losing jobs, support small businesses. Um, we have seen, and this is particularly what we've been looking at in primary care, uh, the extent to which primary care has been involved in the response has varied enormously. In the United Kingdom, although primary care is strong, it was largely ignored by the government, which went to the big corporations for the response, and that has been a spectacular failure. In other countries, primary care played a major role in the response, which obviously impacted on their ability to manage primary care, uh, the other conditions, the non-communicable diseases, and telephone helplines, a shift to online consultations. Um, we have seen in a number of countries the creation of hot hubs, as has been done in Singapore and other countries in Asia in the past after SARS. We learnt, but we learnt late, to separate potentially infectious patients from others, triage facilities, new pathways for care with patients being assessed in ambulances, a huge increase in remote consultations on phone, on Zoom, on Skype, and so on. But the issues that are, we're finding there is that there have been more structured consultations. The consultations have been um, more narrow, more uh, formulaic, uh, and less of the sort of chat that you might normally have in a consultation. There are challenges in many countries of how to pay for remote consultations, because many in many countries, doctors are paid when the, doc, the patient goes to the surgery. Doctors and nurses are complaining about the loss of the nonverbal clues, watching the patient walk into the consultation room. 
seeing them limp or have difficulty standing up or sitting down, the inability to do simple physical checks such as taking a pulse, and a huge issue, even in the United Kingdom that is in theory well connected, we are finding there are large parts of the country where people are effectively digitally excluded. They're not connected to the internet, particularly in um, the more, well, clear, mostly in the most deprived areas, particularly in areas with large black, Asian, minority, ethnic populations, and with a gendered element too, because in many, many communities, women have less access to the internet than men. So that is a very brief overview of what we've seen so far. Looking ahead, clearly we're very concerned about long COVID. I put this down as a non-communicable disease. Uh, of course, it's on the verge because part of it is to do with the blood clots that arise, the endothelial dysfunction and so on. And we have published a policy brief that you can see, which uh, is between the World Health Organization and the observatory. And another group that I work with is the Simple COVID group. And again, you can Google them. And this is a means of trying to simplify messages so that the people in the ordinary public can, can get the messages in a clear way that isn't too clinical and they don't get lost. Um, in long COVID, we are going to have a major challenge for non-communicable diseases. We need systems to gather data. We need cohort studies and registers. We crucially need to listen to people who are affected. There are self-help groups growing up and they are very important. We need multi-professional, multidisciplinary services, which is difficult in some countries where you have clinicians who tend to work on their own. And we need to make sure that we allow people to engage in research. So with that, I'll simply say thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Prof Martin. So that is a picture we hear of a situation in a developed country. I wonder what it's like in a developing country. Can we invite our next panelists? Maybe we can do with uh, Professor Dato Dr. Awang Wilgiba. Can you give us a take of, of your views on this topic? Ah, uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> can we just uh, I just got uh, a few slides. Um, uh, to share with everybody. So this, uh, I was told that I, I'm limited to just three slides, but uh, effectively there are only uh, three slides, but uh, there are a few accompanying uh, other slides. Now I have to mention that I, I, I uh, some of these papers uh, can be downloaded, of course, of the web. They're free of charge. The rest were provided to me by my two colleagues uh, here. Now I had a look through the papers from the BMJ and, and other journals. And uh, clearly, of course, there are challenges for NHS hospitals during COVID-19 the pandemic, as uh, Professor McKee has, has said. And uh, the WHO survey, uh, which was mentioned in the BMJ paper, I'll talk about the WHO survey a bit later on, it has a severe impact on the non-communicable disease care, as, uh, as we can see. Of course, uh, the European Society of Hypertension also published something on the indirect applications of uh, COVID-19 prevention strategies on non-communicable diseases. So the impact of, of an infectious disease management on uh, non-communicable diseases. And there was another paper on prevention and control of non-communicable diseases uh, during the COVID-19 response. Uh, WHO Eastern Mediterranean Region also uh, published uh, uh, a call for uh, countries in the in that particular region, and uh, looking into the the NCD and the COVID nineteen uh, relationship, and uh, the WHO itself, uh, I think, did a study on especially in among lower and middle income countries on how the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic has impacted the non communicable disease management. Now, locally itself, there there aren't too many uh, publications, but uh, I, I did find one by some of my colleagues and looking at, uh, for example, what was the effect on, on uh, trauma surgery trends? Uh, not exactly an infectious disease, but uh, 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 things which were affected by the pandemic itself. And what was the impact on uh, the referral pathways, for example, for urology in, because of the lockdowns which uh, happened in, in Malaysia. So in, in our own hospital, my, my own uh, teaching hospital, how, how did this impact care? On, uh, on urology patients. 
And of course, uh, there were uh, the impacts on, on uh, academic oncology clinical trials. The epidemic also impacted them. And uh, we also found uh, some uh, issues with the uh, cancer screening programs in low and middle income countries, uh, a study coming from uh, the uh, IARC uh, COVID-19 uh, impact study group. So, but not all is uh, doom and gloom. There are some silver linings from qualitative studies which uh, have come up from uh, cancer care, for example. And uh, there are uh, questions, of course, about uh, health literacy and how would this affect the, the uh, bottom, the B40 group, what we call the lower socioeconomic uh, status uh, income groups uh, in Malaysia. How would this, uh, they respond to uh, care during the pandemic? So, so to summarize, I would say, uh, this is uh, probably quite uh, quite have been uh, cited quite a, a number of times before. Two out of ten people globally are at risk of severe COVID nineteen because of non communicable diseases, and the WHO study, which was uh, published in June twenty twenty, says there's about half of the countries which have they they had surveyed had partially or completely disrupted treatment for uh, hypertension and uh, other diseases, and forty nine percent of them for treatment of uh, disease, uh, diabetes and related complications and 40% uh, of them for treatment of cancer. And for cardiovascular emergencies, about a third of them had uh, disrupted treatments for cardiovascular emergencies. The IRC WHO study, which was published in December 2020 in among low and middle income countries, uh, found that nearly all of the 17 countries which had uh, been surveyed had suspensions in cancer screening, which were longer than a month owing to lockdown restrictions, for example, changes in health priorities and reduced patient visits. And some low and middle income countries have uh, had to resort to certain innovations to continue cancer care because of COVID-19 and the subsequent lockdowns which happened in those countries. Delayed care and elective uh, operations have, have happened in many countries, of course, uh, teleconsultation, as uh, Professor McKee has pointed out, and the usage of technology in NCD treatment has been accelerated in many countries. Not altogether uh, a satisfactory uh, response to, to the management of some NCDs, but nevertheless, I think forced uh, upon us. Uh, so these are just uh, some of those papers in which this were derived from. And uh, uh, a paper in Lancet in May 2020 suggested certain things about how we should uh, look at the NCD specific responses during the pandemic. But this is uh, this has already been some months ago. So thank you very much, uh, and that's all uh, for me. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Awang. So it looks like uh, no country is spared from this disruption whether it's developed or rich or poor countries, we're all disrupted. So uh, the next uh, panelist, can we invite uh, Dr. Mike Hankunas from the United Nations University to give his take on this topic? Please, Dr. Mike. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank our honorable and distinguished hosts for inviting me to be a part of today's discussion. Uh, I did prepare a statement that uh, will really reiterate a lot of our uh, fellow panelists' uh, comments that we've already had today. I do wanna start by saying that the COVID-19 pandemic is really not the only pandemic we're dealing with as a society. Long before the world's collective attention was focused on the novel coronavirus, we're suffering from a separate pandemic, so that of non-communicable diseases. Now it's really this interaction between the two pandemics that creates a particularly dire situation for many people. Conditions associated with NCD, so here our topic of conversation around hypertension, also kidney disease, diabetes, are all linked with the development of severe COVID-19. And we know this is really what keeps people in the hospital long-term and can even result in death. So it's the, also the association between obesity and severe disease that is particularly worrying especially given the growing number of younger people who are overweight and obese. Many of the COVID-19 prevention and mitigation strategies that were presented there by Prof. McKee show that they also indirectly promote weight gain. So limiting both formal and ad hoc exercise opportunities because of lockdowns and also through institutionalizing these work from home measures. 
The new work from home arrangements has, have also led to a change in eating habits, mostly unhealthy. So this includes increased consumption of high fat and high sugar snacks that are really easily accessible in the home. The overall stress of the pandemic has had serious impacts on mental health as well, which has increased consumption of alcohol and concordingly decreasing sleep quality, all of which can also impact an individual's weight and body composition. Together, the term pandemic weight gain has really entered the common vocabulary along with COVID-19. The rapid onset of COVID-19 has also resulted in a near overnight shift in the clinical and human resources towards detecting and treating COVID-19. So in many places, this shift towards COVID-19 resulted in pushing NCD care and treatment down in priority. Across many health systems, healthcare workers treating NCDs were already in short supply and the care provided varied greatly in quality. In many parts of the world, care for NCD patients was substandard to begin with, even before COVID-19 hit the scene. The diversion of healthcare resources towards COVID-19 have exacerbated these very serious challenges. The repeated surges, which we're seeing again now in COVID-19 around the world, has clearly tested health systems in unanticipated and in unprecedented ways. The lack of overall capacity now threatens the ability for health systems to provide adequate quick care for patients with NCDs in many, many settings. The closure of NCD clinics and the reallocation of these resources to face COVID-19 threatens to derail and even roll back a lot of the progress that have been made in NCDs. As we all know, early detection and adequate routine management of NCDs are essential in determining a patient's long-term health outcomes. In many places, NC patients with NCDs are aware of the increased risk of serious COVID, which can lead them to avoid health facilities. And this is intended to reduce their own risk to exposure to the virus, but it translates in, into people skipping routine monitoring appointments, going without medication refills, and also waiting until their condition becomes severe before seeking medical intervention. Patients with lung-related ailments, such as asthma, they have a difficult time in using masks themselves because they can feel suffocating and can even induce an asthma attack. So things like this also persuade people to remain at home. This influences clearly their health-seeking behavior, but also can limit their physical activity and their ability to, again, secure healthy foods. Overall, if not watched very closely, the physical distancing, quarantine measures, and fear of contracting the virus can lead to unhealthy dietary changes, physical inactivity, increases in tobacco use, as well as harmful use of alcohol, all of which we know worsen the metabolic syndromes underlying NCDs. Now, I want to shift our thinking to consider the inequitable health consequences of the pandemic as well. So these, of course, relate to the morbidity and mor mortality due to COVID-19, but there are also impacts on non-COVID-19 mortality. So we're talking about increases in deaths due to heart disease, diabetes, dementia, all of which are particularly pronounced for individuals on the lowest end of the wealth spectrum. Coinciding with the decrease in formal treatment for patients with NCDs, the burden of caregiving has increased at home. And this is particularly for women without, within the household who are often tasked with providing care and now schooling for children who are confined to the home. The unbalanced level of caregiving burden between men and women threatens also our progress towards the sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 5, which pertains to gender equality. It would be irresponsible for us not to look at issues, uh, uh, gender-related issues, moving forward, including those of health, economics, access to education, and food security. I look forward to hearing from our panel and audience on how to address equity issues related to NCDs and the downstream impacts that COVID-19 has had on our health system. I thank our honorable host again for this opportunity and look forward to participating in our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Penconas. Again, you have highlighted the dilemma that the world is in now. If not for the internet, maybe we are in even hopeless case. Do you think? 
Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is the first time I hear that because of the lockdown, people stay at home and this increased the incidence of obesity, which makes uh, the, the situation even worse in terms of uh, the risk issue with regards to the nine cities. And uh, I wonder what uh, the view is from our own uh, uh, head of uh, the hospital system in the country, Dr. Faisal Izwan Mustafa. Can you please share your views, Dr. Faisal? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good morning, afternoon, and evening to all participants. Uh, thank you for the uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, thank you as well for the opening remarks from my fellow panelists. I'll try not to repeat um, what have been said. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to make uh, four key points uh, for our discussion uh, in this forum. Firstly, um, any discussion about management of MCDs uh, needs to take into account what was pre-COVID and now with COVID. I think we need to understand what's the baseline. That's the first one. Second point I'd like to make is that when we talk about MCDs, uh, people in the context of COVID-19, uh, people like to focus more on the service provision. Uh, the management of the disease. Let's not forget the full range of um, NCD management that starts from health promotion, screening early detection, management, rehabilitation, and palliative care. That's the full range. Okay. The third point I like to make is that while we like to talk about service provision, that means availability of service, let's not forget the demand side what's the health seeking behavior of the population, all right? And in this context, again, I'll bring it back to my first point, pre-COVID and now with COVID. So this is more specific to the country, to Malaysia, because now my fourth point, we are talking about behaviors, right? So for example, when I talk about health screening, what was the behavior of Malaysians before pre-COVID? What was their health screening behavior? And we have research on that. What is their health seeking behavior once they have the disease? So that is the four main points I like to raise. And in looking at all these four points, I like to bring back what uh, Mike have said about inequity. NCDs affect populations disproportionately, very much like COVID-19. Uh, these are not my words, somebody else's word, you know, we are all facing the same storm, but we are in different boats, right? Um, the um, Prof uh, Awang mentioned about the B40. So the vulnerable groups are more susceptible to both NCDs, to both COVID-19, to also to COVID-19, and also their behavior puts them more at risk to exposure to COVID-19, and uh, Mike also made a point about behavior changing towards the more the negative. And this is um, when, during COVID-19, and this is more likely to happen in the vulnerable groups. So inequity comes into play. So I'll stop there first, Prof. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Faisal. Well, uh, it looks very clear that this pandemic, although this is the first time that we are up with this kind of uh, level of pandemic, scientists, especially those who study the, the habitats of uh, microbes, they are saying that this is not going to be the last one because there will be future pandemics that will, uh, will emerge in the future. So now the question is, are we ready for the next one? And can we learn some lessons in terms of managing the other health uh, aspects of the population. Because now, because we are not really prepared for this pandemic, so we have been focusing only on the COVID. And most of the other things have been disrupted and, and disturbed. So how can we better prepare for the next pandemic? So maybe, uh, Dr. Faisal, you can start with this. Okay. Um... What are the lessons learned? Um, yes. Definitely, we need to look at pre-COVID. 
So I, I think that would be a good starting point um, for our discussion. Um, we are already, um, I use the word struggling um, to manage patients with NCDs. And we have not been successful in addressing NCD risk factors. And I quantify this by the increasing burden of NCDs as evidenced by the National Health and Mobility Survey and also the burden of disease study. So when you talk about, let's talk about disease prevention, that's you're talking about addressing um, exposure to NCD risk factors, and these are common risk factors, physical inactivity, smoking, um, unhealthy eating, and alcohol. There's already a question about, you know, how does COVID-19 lockdown actually perpetuate return to sedentary lifestyle? Um, so, I'll, I'll get back to that later. So how well are we addressing behavior? So I'm going to come back to behavior again. It is a combination of both individual responsibility and the responsibility of the government. And HMS 2019 has shown that health literacy is still low for a majority of Malaysians. Only one third of adult Malaysians have got adequate health literacy. And this is uh, in HMS 2019. So, one thing that we have learned, health literacy is something that we need to work on, on top of all the other literacies. Um, so um, that will be my immediate response. Why? Because I feel why health literacy, basically we need to look at how we can change the behavior of Malaysians. Yes, it is important to strengthen health systems, but even when health systems is strengthened, my concern is, our population will not engage it well, especially the vulnerable groups, for many reasons. We can talk about that later. So, health, um, so changing behavior is one big lesson for me. How do we do it? I don't have an easy answer. Perhaps my other fellow panelists can help me with that. Secondly, the healthcare system need to be able to cope with firstly, not just NCDs, but secondly, with an aging population. A lot of low and middle income countries are fast becoming aging as well. And age is another risk factor of COVID-19. Um, if you look at this um, pandemic, uh, let's not talk about the next pandemic. So the health system to able to cope, changing the behavior. Um, so that's my two key points. I'll stop there first, uh, Prof. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That is a very interesting thing that you have brought in, behavior. Literacy. I think I quite agree with you. We may have the best health system, but if the people are not responding to it in a positive manner in terms of assessing it, then we, we still have problem. Maybe we can learn from or we can listen to the experience of the developed economies. Uh, Prof. Martin, do you have some views on this? The comment I on do. literacy and behavior? Well, I was going to go a bit beyond that, if I might, and maybe yeah, pick up please. on some yeah. of his comments, uh, because uh, you said that we, we're all in, you know, we're we're all in boats, and 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 effectively we've been looking in the same boat, but we're doing we're navigating in different ways. So, uh, can I share my slide for my slides just for a minute? Yes, because please. I'm on please. the um, I'm the rapporteur for the Pan European Commission on a Health and Sustainable Development. And uh, that is a commission uh, reporting to WHO, uh, but primarily not health people. So we've got two former prime ministers, three former presidents, central bank governors, people like that on it. And the model and framework we're using in this is to say that the experience of COVID was like being in a ship in a storm. So I was uh, struck by your analogy. And if we, if we think of it in that way, we need to look at what we uh, needed to do before the storm. Um, so we needed to have a weather forecast. We needed, and we're proposing an intergovernmental panel on health threats, which will be like the panel on climate change. We need global public goods like lighthouses and things like that. We need money for preparedness and we need supplies. But during the storm, we need decisive leadership from captains or prime ministers or presidents. We need systems of communication and we need surveillance. Um, systems, the lookout. We need to make sure that we're following the right chart. We need to have crews, health systems that are in place with teams of people that are equipped and are working together in a non-fragmented way. And crucially, we need ships. We need strong and secure 
infrastructure, healthy population, dealing with the non-communicable diseases that put people at risk. But very briefly, just to move on, the way in which we're trying to bring together all of these risks, and this is work in progress, is that we're focusing on the one health, the interaction between animal, human, and environmental health, then looking at the traditional prerequisites for health, like peace and water and food and shelter, but moving to the more modern ones, healthcare, social networks, digital access, access to justice, then addressing the threats to health from harmful commodities like tobacco, alcohol, and junk food, but also the threats from racism, populism, organized crime, hostile artificial intelligence, and wrapping it all up in the emerging evidence on planetary health. So that's the approach that we're taking. But in this commission, what's interesting, I think, is that we're not telling countries what to do in their health systems. That's up to them. But because we're working with the financial sector, with other government sectors, with heads of government, this is about creating the conditions that will make it easier for governments to do the right thing. So whenever the IMF come to a country, they will no longer be saying, we want you to cut your public spending. They will be saying, we want you to invest in your health systems, because that is a way of making sure your country is resilient. So that's where we're going. And I think it's relevant to this discussion. It's a different level, uh, but I think uh, you can see the way that we're thinking. Yeah, very good. You mentioned working together. I think, uh, if we move forward, looking at what is happening in the pandemic now, the working together among countries will be even more urgent in the future, I think. And, and this is, I think, a topic that, uh, that should be also looked at. Now, uh, maybe we can go to Prof Awang to hear from him because he is a public health specialist and to see how the whole system of uh, management and health system in, in, in the world will have to change, you know, because of this uh, experience in the pandemic. Yes, Pro Awang. Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. You know, uh, one, one of the things that I, I would like to say is that uh, often when, when we say we, we want to adopt um, a whole society approach, for example, to any particular disease, we don't actually do that. So when we uh, we say that we want to tackle NCDs, for example, a lot of it is from the curative point of view, not so much from the prevention uh, point of view, whereas the prevention is probably going to work out a lot cheaper than uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, maintain or, or, or help somebody maintain a, a, a reasonably a good quality life uh, after diagnosis of, say, diabetes or, or high blood pressure or hypertension. So... I think uh, many many healthcare systems have, have forgotten about that that preventive part uh, in thinking that uh, you, you just got to pump more in more money. There, there's there's never going to be enough money to to be able to manage diabetes well or to be able to uh, manage uh, hypertension well uh, and so on. And the, the rising levels of uh, obesity and and overweight, as we can see in in Malaysia and our NHMS, I think it has been noted that over the i don't know how many years it's been like what two two decades since the nhms has has been has been uh, carried out in malaysia the levels of overweight and obesity has not decreased at all and correspondingly the uh, the levels of the diabetes have increased uh, over the years and i'm sure the levels of uh, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome has also increased so the the attention which curative care gets is way way more than, than preventive care, which is really unfortunate because preventive care has the potential to save more money in the long run uh, rather than trying to, uh, to, to do this uh, curative care. The, the second part that, that uh, I, I think we, we really need to relook at the way that um, we prepare for the next pandemic, because I don't think this is going to be the last pandemic they're going to face, is that uh, we really got to work uh, together and we really got to have really good uh, data. Data sharing is, is uh, I think, imperative right, in, this, in this world. There's, there's, no, there's no point trying to hoard data and trying to uh, have control over data if it, it's not help, going to help anybody. I believe in transparency of data and open uh, science approach. As, uh, as the Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim knows, the Academy of Sciences in Malaysia is a very pro-open science 
uh, <laughs> approach uh, organization. We have a project going on, which, which where we are trying to make uh, op uh, data very open and transparent. Uh, of course, there will be certain limits to this, this transparency, but we realize that in order to, to really help society along, we've got to have a more transparent approach. And I think we, 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 for, for, for the future, we really got to engage people at the very basic level and understand how, why they're they are doing certain things. I think uh, Dr. Faisal Mustafa has alluded to this uh, behavior. And it is it's so important to, to understand why people do what they do, for example. So why do some people, even during the pandemic, we increase their physical activity instead of uh, leading a sedentary lifestyle? Is there some kind of a moment of epiphany or whatever it is that, that, that prompts them to do that? And why is it that some people will not follow uh, lockdown measures, for example, the uh, standard operating procedures, uh, mask wearing, or whatever it is? Why do people get tired of this, this, this uh, SOP fatigue, or whatever you want to call it? Um, you know, so we, we don't know enough about that. And I have always said that um, as an epidemiologist, yes, fine, it's, it's good to, to know numbers, and, but I really don't understand why people do what they do. And we really must have a good uh, understanding. And we really must communicate this, this uh, whatever we do well enough to the public. Because if we don't, then if we appear to be condescending or we, we appear to have to send out mixed messages, we are never going to, to do things well. So for the future, I think there's a lot for us to do uh, if we want to prepare for, for this. And certainly, I think if we wish to prepare for the next pandemic, we better do something about this modifiable uh, diseases that we have now, the NCDs, and uh, some, there's nothing you can do about age, unfortunately, it's not really modifiable, but there, there's a lot that you can do about uh, the, the conditions which predispose to NCDs, and uh, I think we really need to pay attention to trying to prevent that, to, to build the resistance of, and resilience of populations rather than trying to uh, deal with the after effects of uh, whatever it is which, which comes along. Uh, that's just my, my short take on it. Yeah, from Awang, you have raised a very number of very interesting points there. I would like to touch on the one you talk about prevention. We all know all these preventive measures that should be undertaken, but because of behavior, our behavior, the human behavior, maybe the one which is stumbling block to the prevention. So maybe why don't we ask our friend from the United Nations University? Do you actually uh, subscribe to this kind of uh, views about uh, prevention, behavior, and communication? Please, Mike, Dr. Mike. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think these are uh, very important things for a number of reasons. Uh, one is, as uh, uh, Professor Agwan was uh, uh, Awang was saying, uh, these are our uh, return on investment is so high on our preventative care. Um, these are things that if we get a hold of early in the cycle can, can nearly uh, alleviate the downstream burden of a lot of, of NCDs. Now that does take investment. I think that's another thing um, hit on by our, our colleagues here in the panel. Investment um, here in Malaysia, I think is is good. We're in a, we're in a fortunate position where the, um, universal health coverage has nearly been achieved and we do have a strong health system. We don't have to look very far in our neighborhood to see other countries with much weaker health systems that are in a more precarious space. And that is partially done through the uh, um, international donor space. So we have other countries that are not only dealing with um, NCDs, but also critical fights against uh, infectious diseases, including malaria, TB, and others, where the, um, the, the, the pot of money is being split quite uh, thinly, and what, what is preserved for non-communicable diseases can be quite low. And within that pot of money, how much of it goes to uh, behavior change, to preventative services, to uh, uh, public communication, these things that we know have a large, again, return on investment, but they're more difficult to implement. And when we talk about seeing uh, immediate impacts, 
something I know that uh, uh, Prof. McKee can talk to as well. These things don't tend to move the needle as quickly, right? Our, our preventative services, it's difficult to measure what, what didn't happen. Uh, but these are the things that perhaps, again, have the largest impact downstream. So uh, those are my immediate reactions there. Thank you. Yes, very important, Dr. Mai, investment. I agree completely. Uh, I'm not sure whether our investment in the health system is uh, up to the mark, but I, I believe it's not just investment in the system, also investment in the talent and investment in the technology. Talking about technology, I think even at the moment, if we have not been having the internet, we would have suffered even more, I think. So do you think that the, uh, the panelists, do you think that uh, uh, we should move towards a more digitalized kind of management uh, for the NCDs uh, uh, in terms of healthcare and even the digital uh, infrastructure will have to be uh, invested in more and the technology to connect in terms of the digital healthcare. This is an area and a lot of panelists, most of the panelists mentioned about data, sharing of data. Do you think that this can happen uh, in a climate uh, where a lot of countries are not even uh, willing to share the vaccine? So, Mike, maybe you can start first. Yeah, I think it's critical. I think it's uh, something that is nearly itself a, a global public good. And when we talk about differential responses to interventions, but also differential uh, levels of exposure and differential uh, uh, disease outcomes, these are all very critical things that are measured through open and shared data. I know the, um, the current uh, dilemma around uh, the vaccine being a global public good is somewhat separate, but we can piggyback on those conversations to talk about the accessibility of data, both at the, the, the national level, but even individualized data, of course, uh, anonymized. Again, it goes back to our questions around equity and uh, uh, conversations now happening around the, uh, uh, the sex-based inequities, but be it between men or males and females, and then gender-based as well between women and men. Uh, these are things that are, that are really geared through uh, detailed data analysis that is shared globally. And personally, I'd love to see more. I think this is something that the um, international scientific community could, of course, uh, come together around and play, place some additional emphasis, but also pressure on uh, those who make the decisions around data sharing. Thanks. Yes. And maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Faisal in Malaysia, are we actually sharing a lot of our data in the country as far as the health matters concerned? All right. Dr. Faisal, um, yes. Thank you. So the diplomatic answer, Prof. Wangan, <laughs> diplomatic answer. Um, if you're talking about behavior here again of sharing. Um, firstly, uh, I don't think we have very good or very clear uh, policies um, of data sharing. Secondly, even if there's clear policies, I think our behavior um, of not sharing. Um, perhaps we can do one of those uh, IDI, right? In-depth interview why we don't want to share data and make that anonymous. Um, I think there's a lot of suspicious. I, I, this is very specific in the context of Malaysia. I do apologize to Martin and Mike as well. Um, so this is very context specific. So we're very reluctant to share data. Um, I, I mean, I have my theories. Um, I will, Prof. I will have mu uh, much more experience uh, on on that. So, um, so data is something that's very important, definitely. Uh, sharing is important because when you have limited resources, you need to be able to leverage on the available expertise, not just within um, which or the government, but also outside of the government. Back to you, Prof. Yes, maybe we can ask Prof. Martin, how do we overcome this big stumbling block of not sharing data? There are Prof. a Martin. host, <laughs> thanks. 
you know, there, there are a whole series of issues and we're looking at this in, a, uh, uh, in an international context in, in, in Europe at the minute. You know, within Europe, well, there are two issues for us. First of all, within Europe, we have the general data protection uh, regulation, the GDPR, which permits transfer of data within the European Union, which of course now does not include the UK. Uh, but, even, but then that creates problems for sharing data beyond the European Union. And one of the things that I think we will be recommending is that we need to look further at that to allow international sharing beyond the European Union's borders. Uh, and of course, that is a problem for medical research for all sorts of other things, but also for the pandemic response. <coughs> Sorry, we do have to accept that there is a loss of trust in, 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 in safety now. Facebook, uh, you may have seen the recent release of a, a leaked email by Huffington Post. Um, Facebook have been engaged in a campaign to divert attention from the massive leak of personal information that they experienced. Mm -hmm. And that is undermining trust because people have been willing to share their most intimate details on social media platforms. Uh, and uh, now we're seeing, I think, a potential backlash against that. So that does not help things. We also need to look at this issue of digital exclusion, the fact that many people are excluded. Uh, but then I think a final point, and, and it's just one I'd like to flag up for looking further ahead, as more and more data become available online and more and more groups come in to exploit that using artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. we are in real dangers there because we've already seen, for example, with the algorithms used by Facebook, a study that was done by a citizens journalist group, ProPublica in the United States, they showed how it was possible to use the artificial intelligence algorithms in Facebook. They had a really nice apartment in Brooklyn to rent and they were able to target the advertisements for it so that nobody could, um, the people who would not see it would be people who were uh, Jewish, who were African-American, or who had ever shown an interest in support for disabled living, so presumably were disabled. And that was easy to do. We are seeing the way in which algorithms, even without anybody programming them, are if the algorithms are based on data from one ethnic group, they may give you the wrong answer in another ethnic group or in another context. So there are a huge number of issues there. So I know I'm not answering the question, I'm just raising more questions, but the whole issue of the digital environment is one where we really need to think about very carefully. We need to have data sharing, we need to harness the benefits, but we also have to remember that there's real potential for abuse as we saw with Cambridge Analytica in the Brexit referendum mm. in the 2016 presidential election in the US, in Kenya and elsewhere. And those are challenges that we need to engage with. Yeah, I think, Prof, you're just saying that data sharing is not the panacea. There are complex things involved. And I believe that the main issue here is trust the lack of trust among people, and that actually influences the behavior. So I think we are into a very complex situation here. Uh, we actually are coming to the end. So what I want to do is that we just want to hear from every panelist uh, your take home message kind of thing to the participants. Can we start with uh, Prof Awang? What is your final say on this? Okay. Uh... Much has uh, much attention has been has been paid to the COVID nineteen because because of course the uh, the havoc that that has wreaked upon uh, not just the healthcare system on 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 the lives but the livelihoods and whole economies or, or countries uh, around the globe. I think that that that's, uh, it goes without saying. But um, if we don't address the NCDs, which uh, which are the ones going to cause uh, multiple problems for us in the long run. We are going to neglect the, uh, the, the important bits of, uh, of health, uh, which uh, will be with us for a very long time. Uh, we do know that aging is, is becoming a, a problem. By 2030, Malaysia itself will be classified as an aging nation, even though technically we are still a young, a young country. But uh, 
uh, there's nothing much you can do about aging except to prepare for it. Uh, of course, there are opportunities with, with aging and the silver economy and, and, and so on. But NCDs is, is becoming increasingly a, a big problem for low and middle income countries. So the twin burden of, of disease that we can see now, I mean, we, we can barely cope with an infectious disease and thank God our population is relatively young, hence our low mortality rates and, and so on. But uh, it is not going to stay young forever. And this twin burden of disease is going to become extremely important, I think, for many low and middle income countries as their proportions age, as they adopt uh, different lifestyles, which are different from their forefathers and, and so on. So I think we really need a holistic approach to, to look at the next pandemic before it hits us uh, to, so that we are going to be better prepared. Because if we don't, I think we're going to be hit even harder than than ever before. And we are strong countries which are really struggling now to, to cope with this just a year plus of, of, of mm. this particular pandemic, you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Faisal, you have your last take on this topic. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to firstly thank uh, Prof. Martin for that overview of the work that he's being involved with in preparation uh, for, for, you know, next pandemic. I think that's a very good overview. Um, I hope um, once it's ready, we can share it with others. Um, so um, my two uh, final points is firstly, uh, we talked about behavior. Uh, I, we definitely need more studies in behavior. Why I feel it's important is because if you want to intervene well, you need to know the situation well. And I don't think we have enough information to help us devise good interventions for especially vulnerable groups. And we can define vulnerable groups in the broadest sense, women, lower socioeconomic group, um, so and so. Uh, my second main point is related to the work that I do in terms of creating a health promoting environment. Um, this is where I need the help of all listeners as well. We need to be the advocators uh, because these policies lie outside of the health sector. And most probably the listeners for this forum are from the health sector. So um, I, we, we, I need your help um, to, com to advocate that we need better policies, uh, public health policies, um, to ensure that our population is less exposed to NCD risk factors. Um, to Sajja Prof, thank you. Yeah, in fact, I think uh, the project response is also having those kind of objectives to study the behavior, uh, literacy rate, and of course, in the end, the policy, right? So before we move to Prof. Martin, who is going to actually give the final uh, say on the matter because he is leading the whole RESPOND uh, program, maybe Mike, Dr. Mike, maybe you can have uh, some last things to say. Yes, thank you. Just a, a quick comment on yeah. a point that was brought up earlier around the dig digitization of, of healthcare. And I think this pandemic has really expedited a lot of that uh, technology and the use, the use of um, telemedicine, for example. And I just wanna say, we, as we move forward with this, just as we've digitized so much of our white collar work, we need to be careful that the, the gaps in the digital divide are also being filled simultaneously and that we're able to remain supportive to those patients without ready access to the, the various technologies. Uh, the, it is a, it's a great way to reach out to patients and maintain communication when uh, in-person visits are not, are not possible, but it also has the uh, uh, potential to perpetuate inequalities. So as we move forward with using these uh, new and innovative technologies, which we know are very helpful, let's please make sure that they are helpful to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, finally, we have Prof. Martin himself to close the whole thing. Please, Prof. Martin. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers. Thank you to all of the panelists. I think it's been a fascinating discussion and it's really good to share knowledge between uh, Malaysia and the rest of us. I've uh, certainly learned a lot as always. I'm just uh, very sorry I cannot be with you in Malaysia because I always enjoy my visits there. And um, so I, I think just my takeaway message from this would be that I think it's really important that those of us in the health community 
uh, raise our ambition. The pandemic has been a once in a lifetime event. Uh, it has focused the attention of governments in a way that uh, n has never happened before. After this call in about an hour's time, I will be speaking to the planning meeting for the G20 uh, about the work that we're doing, because although we're reporting to WHO, we're feeding into the G20 as well. And so I'll be summarizing a little bit of what I said about the, the wider work. I think that we in the health community need to engage with heads of government, with finance ministries, with other ministries to actually make sure that we do create the conditions that Faisal and others were, and uh, Awang and someone were, were, were talking about that we need to do because all we, too often the situation is that health ministries say, well, we would like to do this, but we're not able to. We're being stopped by the international financial, financial in, um, institutions or by the finance ministry or somebody like that. We are working to change that because the finance ministries and the others and I know that if they do not protect health, they will pay more in the long run. We've been saying it for years. Now we've seen it happen. So I'm just saying raise our ambition. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Martin. Uh, definitely, I think the discussion has been very uh, interesting. I have learned a lot from this uh, engagement. And I hope the, uh, the participants have also been following uh, the fruitful discussion we had. Now I just pass back to Dr. Maza. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Okay, I think, uh, should I have one last question actually from the uh, attendees for Prof. Martin actually. I think uh, this is in the chat box. Uh, Prof. Martin, uh, what have you built in your health system that allow for you to have excellent data for informing decision making? Uh, well, I think that first of all, within the United Kingdom, we have four systems. The Scottish data are the best. Uh, but there are also in Europe, there are very high quality data in the Nordic countries where they have really good linkage. I think what we need to make sure is that we are able to link data from the social sector, the health sector and other sectors so that we can look at people as a whole. Um, I, I, the, there are still a lot of gaps in the United Kingdom. We miss out data on the private sector, which is a problem um, which we've been talking about for a long time. So it's not perfect. I think, and I realize this is a controversial issue in some countries, and I know that it's going to be controversial in Malaysia as it is in other countries, So, I, but I'll say it anyway. We need to really look at issues around uh, groups that are disadvantaged, vulnerable, separate, whatever. Um, and that means getting into data, not just about education and income and, and other things, but also ethnicity and so on. That is a challenge for European countries in particular, um, that we need to not pretend that these are not issues. They are issues. Um, but I, I, I fully, um, I understand the national sensitivities about these issues in all countries, uh, but it has been a critical issue in Europe because in some countries like the United Kingdom, we do have data which allows us to see, for example, that there are you know, Bangladeshi uh, communities and others have been left behind, particularly some of the South Asian communities and, uh, and to be able to target our resources, but in a way that does not make life worse for people, we need to be very careful with the sensitivity. So those are just a few thoughts off the top of my head on our data. Okay, thank you, Prof. Martin. Yeah, I agree that it is very important to go into detail and personalize for the individuals in understanding their life um, risk factors for this, developing this NCD and make it worse. What more with the impact of COVID-19? Okay, with that, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists, moderator, Prof. Dato Ahmad, and all the participants for this uh, attending to this forum. Before we uh, end, I would like to invite all the panelists and Dr. Dr. Ahmad to switch on your video and get ready for a screenshot photo session. Okay, uh, yeah, all right. So smile on the camera. One, two, smile. Thank you. Okay, with that, we from Centre and Respond Team UITM appreciate all the panelists for being here and all the participants. 
and really appreciate what we have learned from this uh, forum with the impact of COVID-19 on the NCD uh, disease management and health system. So we compare the global and the Malaysian perspective. So thank, thank you again for joining us today and have a nice day. Salam Ramadan to everyone. Bye. Thank you very much.